Welcome to the Surgical ICE Learning in the OR webinar. We're very thrilled to have people on the phone and um, internet with us as we broadcast this is our third webinar for the Hofstra Norsha LIJ Health System. There's a team of us here tonight, myself, Alice Fenari, the Associate Dean of Educational Skills Development, and along with me you'll be hearing from Taranjita Huja, who is the co-director of the initial clinical experience, which we call ICE at Hofstra, and Dr. Robert Scanlon, who is a co-site director at Huntington Hospital and a preceptor for ICE students to give some first-hand experience. So we're very excited about um, the surgical ICE, and we're hoping that this will take an experience that we know will be good, but we want it to be great. So the purpose of tonight is to go from good to great with the surgical ICE. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ahuja now for an introduction. Good evening. This is Taryn Jita Huja. I want to thank you for joining us uh, and taking time out from your evening. I want to just start off by reviewing some of the um, big goals of the surgery initial clinical experience. So we want the students to be able to see a patient in the pre-op operative and post-op visit. It doesn't have to be the same patient. The, um, the experience spans over three weeks, so definitely is possible to fit those three categories in. And they are expected to come in to see you for half a day for the weeks of February 3rd, the 10th, and the 17th. Just to note that Monday, February 17th is President's Day, and it's an official holiday for the School of Medicine, but the students are expected to spend a half a day for these three weeks in the OR uh, with you or in your office, wherever, wherever you may be. So the students are in class in the morning and are mainly available in the afternoon. However, we have freed up the Tuesday mornings during those three weeks where they actually have an optional review session and we've actually, uh, flipped the, those review sessions to the afternoon to make their morning slots available because we know most surgeons do operate in the morning. When you touch base with your student, just let them know where they can get their scrubs, where they can put their belongings, maybe some things that they just don't know. Uh, they all have health system badges. They have Hofstra badges as well as badges to the specific site you may belong to. Um, I have met all the nursing leadership at each ICE site and have given them pictures to you know, show them what the students look like. So we have open doors of communication with, at the nursing end as well. And the students have attended a scrub workshop that was run by the health system at the School of Medicine, so they, do, they know how to scrub. And they are you know, covered under medical liability and are under supervision, can do anything a third or fourth year medical student can do under supervision. Um, and the experience that we have in the calendar is three weeks, but it's minimal. So if they want to spend more time with you on their own, we welcome that. We don't hold them back in any way. And that's pretty much the end of my, my part, but I'm always here. If you have any questions, you can send me an email. I'm going to pass it on to uh, Dr. Scanlon at this point. Uh, hello, my name is Bob Scanlon. Uh, as we said before, I am a preceptor. I'm an obstetrician. Uh, I still do a little bit of GYN surgery, so I've had an opportunity to have my student uh, up in the OR. And I think uh, based on that, we're, we're, we're comfortable putting this together. Uh, if you look at what you're seeing right now, you know, we have, again, this is a short burst that these students will be exposed. So, so clearly, my note down there at the bottom is, remember, these are first-year medical students who were just looking to have an experience as opposed to training a resident or even a fourth-year clerk uh, in surgery. Uh, we're looking for them to have the experience through the eyes of the patient. What is it like to have anesthesia-induced um, during the surgery to actually see anatomy in a patient? Um, and to give them some exposure in your office and in the operating room to preoperative, uh, intraoperative, and postoperative care. Um, so let's begin with, as Alice had said, how are we going to take this experience, which we know is going to be good. These are students who are desirous of being physicians and are looking for exposure. Uh, and there is no better place, as we can all remember, and, and um, 
speaking to a crowd that was clearly sold on this, is surgery is something we all want to be exposed to. Everybody asks us about the surgical experiences that we had. Um, so let's make this as good as we can for the students because some of them, their surgical experiences will be minimal through life if indeed they choose a non-surgical specialty. Alrighty. The key, I think, for something like this is letting the student understand their role on your team, set the expectations for the experience. So if you have them in the office and they're going in to do a wound check, let them understand what the operation was, what your concerns are, what you're looking for within that wound check. If you have them in the operating room with you and you're removing a gallbladder, you let them understand what you're going to be doing and now ask the students what their expectations are and have they ever been in an operating room before? Do they understand what this procedure is? Uh, speak at the level of a first year medical student. So I'm going to walk you through what has proven to be somewhat successful. And let's take it for the in-hospital experience. And as we're all now accustomed to, we sort of gather at the bedside of the patient in the holding area. And that's your first opportunity to introduce your medical student as your medical student observer, introduce to the nursing and the anesthesia staff, which again usually happens in the holding area, and have the student then stay with the patient. Even if you're going to go get a cup of coffee while the patient rolls in, have the patient stay, excuse me, the student stay with the patient, observe the induction of anesthesia, observe the timeout process that we do, meet the circulating nurse, and sort of, as I said, my note is this is as quick as we're trying to do it, we're trying to build a relationship. We're trying to give them a role on your team. And really the role on your team is to be an observer. But everybody knows who they are and they'll fit in a little more comfortably then. Alright, so now once we're in there, there are certain tools that have, uh, that have a little time tested methodologies that we know have been successful in what's a good way to train a student in something like an operating room? And I'm going to pass this off to Alice because this is really her expertise. So it's great to have the voice of Dr. Scanlon because he's, you know, obviously an, beyond being a clinician educator in the OR. And I'm an educator per, by profession, so I'm going to talk about what should happen. So there's a technique called directed observation skills. So what happens here, obviously the student is going to be observing, they're not going to be doing surgery at this stage of their career, but we want to point out there's a difference between just saying come in the OR and see what you observe. The student stands there at that point and sort of dazes off and maybe thinks about a TV show they watched or a textbook they read or what they're going to eat for dinner or anything in their mind and they sort of go into space. But if you use the skill of directed observation, where you say to the learner, we're going to be in the OR, and I'd like you to observe these three things. Observe how I correspond with or talk to the anesthesiologist. Observe how I prepare the patient for the cut, in terms of what I do. Or observe how I close the patient. Whatever you feel is the most important aspect of that operation, give the student two or three things to observe. Now, they're going to observe everything, obviously, but this gives them an opportunity to really be focused on two to three things that you think are the most important during the surgery that you're performing. And we call this directed observation. So it's a way to keep the student focused. The other important thing is to role model your interactions with the team. Now, it might be so natural for you to interact with the team, you're not even thinking how you could teach the student anything about this, because you do this how many times a week? But for the student, seeing your interplay with the other nurses, with the surgery techs, with the anesthesiologist, all this is a team approach to the care, and it's all new to them. So really be very deliberate and point out your interactions. 
And then as you move into some decision-making mode, you know, should I cut here? I didn't realize his abdomen, the layers of fat, whatever. Think about your decision-making and talk out loud. It's best, there's been evidence in the literature about teaching in the OR, and the evidence is that when a physician talks out loud, the learner really picks up on the, on the teaching that is happening. In addition, it allows the teacher, which is what you are, to really clarify the steps they're going through to the learner. So don't be afraid to talk out loud and say, now I'm going to describe how I prepare to do the initial incision. Now I'm going to see how I close. This is how I tie knots. This is all very important. So three things, directed observation, two to three things to watch, role model interacting with the team, Think about your clinical reasoning and decision making that's happening in your mind and teach it out loud. Bring it to the environment with the student. Even if you normally don't do this with the student with you, this is best practice. And Bob's going to finish on the last point here. And I'm going to jump right in because Alice's point of teaching out loud, uh, for some of us like myself, I'm out of a small community hospital. We typically don't have students. We don't have residents. And our nurses have seen, let, let, let's just use my most common operation, a cesarean section. So my nurses have seen this thousands of times. They don't need me to say, okay, now I'm cutting the fascia. Now, I'm, now we're cutting the uterus. This is the amniotic sac. But interestingly, we have seen with our students, when we just sort of walk it through, it really gives them a level of comfort. We can talk through anatomy, which they never would see in, in, in a live patient. It is quite an experience for them. So if I can integrate in, you know, ask little questions, but you don't even have to. If you just talk through what you're doing, we're cutting through the skin, now we're in the subcutaneous layers, now we're in excising the fascia, then you can throw a little basic science in. Hey, you guys know it's the fascia that holds us together. It's not actually our muscles. It's amazing how this becomes actually a nice little play that you put on. And interestingly, you're going to find that everybody in the operating room starts contributing that. The circulating nurse starts talking, starts saying, oh, yeah, make sure, hey, Dr. Scale, make sure you show them the ovary. The scrub tech will say, oh, yeah, this is where we do such and such. Remember when we had this kind of a case? So it, it becomes something that everybody gets a little more juiced about because we're kind of doing something a little bit different. We're putting a show on for our students. Okay? I just want to mention, um, Dr. Scanlon said something. If this, and going on what Dr. Who just said, it's over three weeks, but if they've not seen this patient that they're seeing in the OR in the office, so they didn't have a sequential pre-op, OR, post-op experience with the same patient, it's very nice for you to describe to the student before the surgery or during the surgery, what was the clinical presentation of that patient to get them onto the OR table if they did not see that patient pre-op with you? Because that clinical presentation is what made you have a decision to bring them into the OR. So that's a really important thing to do, especially if they did not see that as a pre-op patient. I'm just going to take a minute to get all the slides up here. So this, this is a um, one more. This is a learning triad. I call this. We have the patients, which are really not participating while they're asleep under anesthesia, but in the pre-op, post-op, they could be participating. The teacher, who's a role model, explaining, and then the trainee, who's observing and participating as to the best of their ability, and in this case, would be participating through the directed observation route. So there's a lot of observing, and there's a lot of skills demonstration, and as Dr. Scanlon so nicely um, spoke about, this discussion, this sort of little play that's happening in the OR, I love that analogy, and everybody's contributing a little piece of the action to the play to really make sure the learn is learning. So it's a really nice feature having this learning triad, and it really makes it um, much more of a going from the good to the great learning experience for the student. 
So now we're into the post-op stage where the patient has finished the surgery, and I think Dr. Scanlon's going to finish this piece up. Yeah, you know, in, in the same regard, we want to keep the student seeing the surgical experience through the eyes of the patient. So clearly you, as the surgeon, will take the patient to the PACU, uh, but leave the student there. Let the student stay with the patient while you go do your orders, while you dictate your note, uh, see the post-anesthesia situation, and again, you would be so surprised. The nurse who you will introduce to the student will then be, you come back from dictating the case, and she'll be explaining everything about the post-anesthesia time for the patient. This is when you can say, okay, now the patient's stable. This is your time to now circle back to your directed observations. So instead of just giving them that general, what did you see in the OR, which is a tough question, because these guys have now seen something that they've never seen before, you can ask them the questions. Did you see that anatomic structure I asked you to look for? Did you see how I tied knots? Did you notice that I tied them differently, first throw to second throw? That's how I tie a square knot. Little simple things like this, which for us who do it all the time, it's just part of our everyday life. But for a student who were opening their eyes to this, it'll give them a little boost of confidence that, yeah, you told me to look for this, and I actually saw that. So you hit your teaching points. You, you could even, and a lot of times it'll happen, they'll ask a question. And you'll say, good question. You can go home and figure that one out. Because you're going to see them again, typically. So tell them to go home and read about that anatomic structure they're asking about. And then, as quickly as it happens, if you have them with you for two or three cases, then let's start again. Set the expectations for the next case. Go into the holding area. Introduce them as the medical student observer. Make them part of the team again. And let them re-experience that whole cycle one more time. Um, so if I could run it through with you each time, we're always thinking about meeting with the students, setting their expectations, introducing them to everybody who's going to be part of this play that we're going to put on, uh, bring them to the operating room, give them their directed observations, teach out loud, and then do it one more time. Uh, I mean, it's a great opportunity. Uh, it, uh, most of the students like it when there's a few operations. So clearly, if I could kind of uh, encourage you to, if you could get them on a day where you could do two or three, very nice. If it turns out it's only one big long one, well, they just can't go through this cycle multiple times. Okay? So I'm going to get a little educational now because I want you to understand as clinicians the major role you're having in the education of our students. We feel there's a major benefit. We wouldn't be doing this to expose them to community-based surgeons. Um, the School of Medicine is built on a competency-based education system, and you are really touching on five competencies that we have. We have more than five. We have eight, but you're touching on five for sure. The first competency you're touching on is interpersonal communication skills because they're seeing you communicate with team and patient. So there's a double whammy there of both team communication and patient. Obviously, they're seeing patient care. They're seeing clinical care. They're seeing physical exam skills and obviously surgical exam skills as well. Professionalism, we hope to the greatest ability you will role model humanistic care and humanistic care to your team who you work with. So that's a very big piece of professionalism, care to patients and team. The next thing they're going to be seeing is systems-based practice, which is a, obviously a very medical school competency-based term. And this is the efficiency of per patient care. Dr. Scanlon wrote, spoke about pre-op, intraoperative, and post-operative care. That's a system. It's a well-oiled system that they've not seen. So understanding how you prevent error. You mentioned when you get into the OR, that process where you huddle and you say, 
um, we do a timeout. timeout. Dr. Scanlon got it for me. A timeout. That's a systems-based practice that prevents error. They need to understand that. They, they won't be clear on this, but you should be clear on it. And the last competency, I couldn't spell out because it's so long, practice-based learning and improvement, where you identify and help them understand the uncertainties in your mind and how you can go to evidence or best practices to make decisions. Every physician has uncertainties. Every physician has to make decisions. It's not always a clear-cut answer. And it's important for them to see that. So they're actually able to see five competencies that we have in our School of Medicine curriculum. So it's a real honor for them to be with you as community-based surgeons. Sorry. Um, sorry about the clicker. So you're going to be clinical teachers in this role. And as Dr. Scanlon said, as community-based surgeons, you're not always with students. And what you have is a gift to give them. This is a gift a gift of teaching. And the most important gift is enthusiasm. It has been proven that students select specialties based on who they met. It's absolutely in the literature. How did a student make a decision to do X? It's by who they met. I never thought I was going to do this until I met this physician. So your enthusiasm, your professionalism, your ability to demonstrate quality care is really, really going to impact them as future professionals, and you might be influencing people to pick up surgery as a career. It's really important to also learn how to ask questions that are non-judgmental, not threatening, and really get at core learning, and that's a skill set in itself. So we'd like to take a minute, just a break, before we conclude the webinar and see if you could type in any challenges you have or or thinking about and anything you'd like to us to discuss that we've not thought of. So we're here to ask and you could type in, am I correct? On your lap on your keyboard, you could type in the text box any challenges you feel you're gonna have with students and we'll be glad to address them. It could be from the little thing is how are they going to know how to go? to get here, how they want to know how to put where the scrubs are. Any challenge to as, I'm really afraid what the OR nurse is going to say about me having a student. Anything. So does anybody have any challenges they'd like to type in? We'll wait a minute. OK. We have one that just came in. Um, and. and and this is one that you'll have to deal with with your team. Um, one of the issues that comes up, so the question that came in is, how do we explain to our team that this is only a first year medical student? What do we tell them? So, so I, I think what the point is that we're getting at here is, sometimes you will hear from the team, well, these kids have only been in medical school for six months. What are they doing in the operating room? And therein is our role to educate our team to realize that students are coming in as observers. And as I really liked in our couple slides back where Alice said the core competencies, things that build upon what you are as a physician, what a nurse is as a nurse, it's the professionalism, it's the interpersonal communications, it's practice-based skills, meaning Watch what's going on in the operating room. Know your anatomy. So you will let the nurses and the scrub techs know that this is a student's first exposure. It's just a small exposure. It's like taking somebody to watch a baseball game the day before you're going to bring them to their first practice. And I think if they get an idea that these students aren't coming in to be surgeons, to say, I, I need the knife, I'm going to throw sutures, uh, they're just coming in to get a good sense for what's going on, and it's a great teaching uh, environment for us. Uh, we have another question that just came in. So a question that just came in is, how are they certified in scrubbing? Does a nurse instruct them? So we actually went to the uh, periop director of the health system, the North Shore LIJ Health System, who set up scrub workshops at the School of Medicine, and all the students uh, had to go through that workshop. So. Um, that was done through the health system. 
Any other questions before we go on? But there'll be time for questions at the end. So if you don't think of it right now, we'll have another moment before we close. So we just want to mention, as great as we think our students are, and we feel they're ready for this experience, as you know, this is the third year of the Hofstra Norsha LIJ School of Medicine, so it's not the first year we're doing this. Every year we're trying to make it a better experience. Dr. Ahuja mentioned how they have Tuesday mornings free now to do this. This has been a big issue for the surgeons, only being available in the afternoon, so we're being sensitive to the needs of the surgeons to make this easier for you. But the students, you know, always feel the sense of doctors being rushed, time pressured, and this happens with surgery and keeping things on time and making sure that the OR is not too backed up. So that makes students feel a little nervous. Not knowing what you're expecting. Dr. Scanlon spoke about that early on, building a little bit of a relationship, finding out what the student had prior experience, asking what they've done in the anatomy lab in terms of the type of operation happening. If he's doing an operation where he's removing the ovaries, did they look at the ovaries in there at cadaver yet? Maybe yes, maybe no. But getting expectations clear. The students are worried about, they've heard stories about the OR, this is a negative learning environment, people yell at each other, there's a lot of judgment, so you have to obliterate some of that. They don't really have this relationship with you as much as we'd like them to, they're just meeting you for three times total, so relationship is a big word for three times, so let's be, you know, a little real about that. Um, they're going to have trouble, they're going to feel difficult discussing the details of the patient with the surgeon. And they're going to have a fear of making mistakes. What student does not have a fear of making mistakes? And you guys being surgeons, the fear is even bigger, I think, because it's something they're more uncomfortable with. So just realize the students feel challenged. The little picture here has a student in front of the principal's office. So if you remember those days when you sat in front of the principal's office sort of saying, what's going to happen to me next? That's sort of how these students might be feeling. And every student is unique. So just because one student feels one way doesn't mean another. We'd like to also just say that the literature is very, very strong. It's not one article. It's continuous articles over time. This, you see one article is 1980 and one is 2011. That patients like discussions in front of them. So when they're in this holding area in the beginning before they go into the OR and you're talking to the patient and consent is happening or the anesthesiologist is explaining something and you've introduced the student appropriately as a medical student observer that patients like having a student there. They feel doctors explain things more when a student is there. They're not upset by bedside discussion. Doctors have this preempt idea that they are. Actually, the literature from data collection from patients says no. They feel reassured um, by the interpersonal skills of their physician being able to teach in front of them. Um, and they feel, feel, sometimes they feel confused if you use a lot of medical terminology. So obviously we've instructed our students to watch their medical terminology. So it might be a time for you as well. That's the only thing that came up as a negative in the literature was maybe a little bit too much use of medical terminology. So this is a sort of summary of your tasks. And the goal is to inspire and role model, which I'm sure you're capable of doing without this webinar, but we're just reiterating it. And we have somewhat of a five-step process here, just as you would do with a patient. You orient the learner and the, and the patient to the student. You diagnose the learner, expectations and prior experience. You set up the learning encounter, directed observation. You have questioning that's active and focused and not judgmental. And then you assess and give them some feedback if there's an opportunity. So this is a five-step um, process. And this is really a summary of everything I said. I don't have to read this slide to you, but as Dr. Scanlon said, it's so important to begin outside the OR and prepare the student and get them ready. That's the first level. The second level is building a relationship, which Dr. Scanlon spoke so strongly of, the first that. And the third level is actually what's happening in the OR and in the post-op area where you're actually doing your teaching in the OR 
and then you're teaching in the post-op area what's happened with the patient when you're explaining things to either the patient or the family. And then the last point to reiterate is the clinical basic science and anatomy teaching that can happen in the OR. I think it's so important to show them the live anatomy that you get view of. You take it for granted a little bit maybe because you do it so often, as Dr. Scanlon said, how many cesarean sections. Well, if I was that student, for me it would be my first. I saw a cesarean section. I can't believe it. I never imagined seeing one. So you have to take that moment of awe and appreciate it with the student. So I think I'm going to pass if there's any questions to our other, to Dr. Scanlon. Anybody have any questions to ask us for the webinar? You could type them in and we'd be glad to answer them. Okay, I just want to mention... Well, here comes okay. one question. So okay. let's, let's take care of this one. Uh, this one says, you put a lot of emphasis on what happens in the operating room. Uh, I'm a little curious, should I bring the student to the operating room three times, or should I have them come with me to the office? Um, and again, let's back up and think about it. We're not training surgeons. We want them to have a surgical experience. And what you do in the office is critical to that, because you think differently in the office. They will understand how the patient came to you. Did their internist see them? Did a family member refer them? How did they find their way in there? How do you then determine, does every patient that comes to your office get booked to the OR? Well, we know definitely not. So they'll see you thinking on your feet, explaining to the patient why you think the surgical option is the best or is not the best option for them. Um, the second component of seeing patients in the office is you get to see them post-operatively. How did things go? Because most patients go home quickly after the operation. What was it like for the first few days? How long did the catheter have to stay in? How many days of pain medicine did you need to be on? Again, pretty rote stuff for us. For a medical student, they're just seeing this stuff for the first time. And most of these kids, luckily, probably have never had surgery in their life. So it will give them that nice exposure. Um, I just want to say to Dr. Scanlon, I think the office experience as a surgeon is really very important and I think it would be actually better to have them of course go to the OR with you but also to see the office. I think that balance is really important. One of the things they'll get in the office is also does the patient's insurance cover the surgery you're going to do? That's a big issue today. Did they come to you because they're in your insurance plan or were they referred to you and they're not in your insurance plan and how do you work that? That's a big decision maker for patients today. I personally had that decision recently with a surgeon. So that is a very important part of the care. So what happens in the office, the way you um, explain procedures that are going to happen, do you draw pictures, do you have models there? I went to a surgeon recently, he had a model he took out and showed me everything. This is all new to the students. So the office experience is quite important and I think um, an asset that you have to offer the students. And, and you'll have to remember we have, I think, uh, Taranjit, am I correct, we have three half-day sessions scheduled for our students. That's about 12 hours. Right. And that could be at a morning, if you're going to take advantage of that Tuesday morning, if you're a morning operator. Uh, the afternoons, they're much more available. So you might want to be able to, you have to, I think, work in with them when they're going to get to the operating room. And you know you can blend in another day or two um, in the office. And I think my suggestion would be, an office session, an operating room session, and then get a feel from the student. Some students are very comfortable in the operating room, and they're going to jump at another opportunity to go back there. Another student, you might get a feel that they're going to do better going one more time to the office. And that'll be something that you'll just have to work out with your students. And in the office, you might do a procedure. All of you are different types of surgeons. There are some surgeons that do procedures in the office. There's nothing wrong with having a student in the office with you and walking them through a procedure in the office. That's an excellent learning opportunity because it's the type of thing that they might see many times. They've been in the emergency rooms already where procedures are done. They're all certified EMTs. They've all spent time in the emergency room. 
So I definitely would think about office-based procedures as well. So if there's no questions, then we might be concluding. I'd just like to say we really thank you, and I, we're archiving this webinar. And it's going to be on the School of Medicine website. And if you go on the School of Medicine website and you go under faculty and staff, it will link you to the faculty development website and the faculty development website on the home page will have a link to webinars and on the faculty development website home page if you click the link to webinars you will see this webinar so you may not want to hear it again but you might have a colleague that missed it and you could refer them to the online webinar and the entire audio will be there with the PowerPoint presentation. So that's School of Medicine, faculty and staff, faculty development website, and it should be on the home page with a link. Thank you, and we really appreciate you joining us this evening.